It's something that I emphasize on is the fact from stillness, from stillness, do we get the voice to be able to speak out. And very often we think that it's from noise and from activity and from becoming geared up and full of energy that we get energized enough to speak out. But most often it is from stillness that great things happen. And if you look into the life of Jesus, you'll find that often he moved away from people. He went into the desert. He went into the wilderness. He went into the garden of Gethsemane. He went away from people and he prayed. And from there came he derived energy. So what you all are doing is exactly what I try to do in all our classes. That from stillness comes all the energy and loudness that we need to be able to change the world from stillness. Here's what we will do today. Very often we think that writing is a technique. We think that once we know how to put A and B and C D together, that words will form and we'll be able to write. Yes, most probably we'll be able to write good English with that. Or if you're writing in another language, you'll be able to write that language very well. But good writing, good speaking, good communication comes from something else. And this is not just about writing, this is about any field we get into. That it comes from something which we have to do preceding or something that we have to do before going into the process of writing or speaking. And that is emptying ourselves. E-M-P-T-Y, empty. Some years back I had sent my younger daughter to Seattle, that's in America, to study psychology so that she would come back as a therapist. She wanted to come back to be to deal with children and others who are into drugs, also as a family counselor and family therapist, marriage and family therapist. So when she went over there, it's a three-year course, when she went over there, about uh, a month later, I called her up and I asked her, I said, how's the course going? By now I'm sure you being a psychologist, you must be able to understand your dad. She told me, she said, Daddy, the first three months, we have to learn to understand ourselves. It's not about understanding other people. The first three months, we have to empty the baggage that is in us before we can help emptying the baggage that is in other people. And uh, dear students, in the process of being communicators, what very often will stand in our way of being <coughs> effective speakers, effective writers, effective communicators is the baggage that we carry within ourselves. What is that baggage which we are talking about? What is that baggage? Yeah, I came from Bombay to Bhopal on a flight and that's the baggage that we put on the conveyor belt and we brought it out. Something like that. But this is a mental baggage that we carry with us. A mental baggage which starts from childhood, a mental baggage we can start from the mornings also of our daily life. A mental baggage which finally, when we are supposed to speak and be heard, stands in the way. Very, I used to write for an auto magazine called Auto India and also another magazine called Indian Auto because I love cars and I used to always be called when there's a new car in the market, they used to ask me to drive the car and when in that drive I would have to give my uh, feelings about how good the car is and how bad the car is. This is when new cars started coming into the Indian market. So I had a column in that. So I got very passionate about driving and very passionate about uh, uh, about uh, <clears throat> uh, anything to do with cars. Something I started noticing in the Times of India and other papers was the fact that whenever some person got knocked down in an accident, 
you know, an accident. What could be put in the paper was speeding car knocks down person. Now, I don't know how Bhopal is, but in Bombay you can't go more than, more than 15 kilometers an hour because of the traffic jams. You can't go because there's enough traffic over there to stop to see to it that you can't go fast. And in my mind, I wondered how and where could there be a speeding car knocking down people? I mean, when you're going at 15 kilometers an hour, which person can you knock down, even if you try? So, I decided I'll visit the Hindustan Times and Times of India and find out who these journalists are who are writing about speed, speeding car knocking down somebody on the road. When I went over to the uh, <clears throat> newspaper office, I found that the journalists were strange looking people. These are the people who are writing about city roads. I found that they were in a corner, they didn't want to mix, they didn't want to really hang around with the others and so on. And then after talking to them and talking to the other people around, I found that these people had a, what we call in English, a chip on their shoulder, which means that they had a problem with the world. Now, what did they have the problem with the world? What problem did they have with the world was the fact that during college and during school and during their childhood, they felt that they were very good at their creativity. But they, in all probability, were not very moneyed. They were in all probably were, were not very good at everything else. And they did not like the people who had everything. So finally, when they got into a newspaper, they had a weapon in which they could hit out. Do you understand what I'm trying to get? They found that using the pen and using the laptop or using whatever they use nowadays to write, they could write something about those same people they resented who were coming up in life. And here, what an opportunity. So every time there was an accident, they felt in their mind that it was the driver who was to blame. What happened in their wrong reporting? What happened is that instead of the government over there making more pedestrian crossings, instead of the government over there having policemen who would regulate pedestrians to cross correctly, and if you know our country, pedestrians don't know, you and me included, don't know how to cross correctly. It's when you go abroad and you realize that the traffic signal is the most important signal and you get knocked down. Here, here what we have to do as our drivers is to navigate not through other cars and buses but not navigate between people who are crossing the road. So it was wrong reporting because of baggage that the journalist carried from before. Do you understand? Which meant that today's roads and so on, today's traffic signals, today's policemen were never brought to book and better things happen, and better things happening because of wrong reporting. So the same way, something that is very, very important with all we writers, all we speakers is to get rid of our baggage <coughs> literally on a daily basis before we attempt to even go up and speak or to write anywhere. Get rid of your baggage. And so much so that uh, those who have done the course before, <coughs> that's Navya and uh, Sadhana, I tell you, you remember, Vesti used to sing the song. I don't know if you remember, I, I used to, uh, she used to come with a guitar. Vesti, Vesti and uh, Tanya are coordinators in my course. And she would come with her guitar. Did, were you there when she sang? Yes, yes. Okay, she didn't sing, the, sing it during. Now, where was, were you there when she sang it? So she was a coordinator. She still is. She wanted very much here to come, come with me. And I said, no way. I'm going to be spoiled today. And they are spoiled over here. And I'm not bringing any coordinator with me. She would take a guitar. She's very good at singing. And she played the song, Get Empty Your Baggage. Empty your baggage, she used to sing, and it was beautiful. But I'm not going to, I'm not going to sing the song. 
I'm not going to do anything like that way. I'm going to take this word empty and we are going to go into it and build our first acronym. Like I told you yesterday, <clears throat> some of many of you all missed it. An acronym is when I put a word up and then I take each letter and I draw something out of it. Okay? So MT will be E M P T Y. And if you're feeling sleepy, yawn. <laughs> you know what? We should start with the exercise. But no, let's start with the exercise of MT. I think it's good that we brought it over here. The EMPTY of MT is like this. We take the E as to engage with thoughts, incidents that rankle in you, that cause bitterness, anger, and hate. To be able to engage with the thought. Now, one of the first things that my daughter told me that takes place in psychology. Uh, so there are some of you who have done psychology <clears throat> is to be able to look, look into those incidents which have hurt us previously and to be able to open it up again for, for, for some years after she came back and before she got married for nearly six years my daughter is to have her sessions using my office over there in uh, Bombay and whenever I used to pass her door I would hear crying there was always crying she would be speaking to somebody, a patient, they don't call them patients, they call them clients. She would be speaking to one of her clients and they would be crying. And I would ask her afterwards, I said, you know, the, bear, the, the only instrument that your psychologists have are those little paper, paper napkins which are kept around because that's all you need. We have to buy a microphone and a laptop and all that. Your, as long as you have your supply of paper napkins, it's more than enough. Or fair enough. Why? Because people would open up and start crying in the process of engaging with that particular problem which affected them previously. You try it. You try it. One of the reasons that we cover up and we don't like to go back into any kind of a problem is because in the process of going back, we go through all the feelings of bitterness, anger, hurt and so on. Right? Ever try emptying? Ever try engaging with it? It's horrible. Why did you fight with so and so? Ah, let it be. We love the let it be. Let's go through it. Why did you fight with so and so? Oh, this is what she said to me. This is what he said to me. Why did he walk away from your marriage? You ask somebody who's broken up. It's okay. I've got over it. Have you got over it? Let's open it up. Yes. What did he tell you? The next moment, there's a flood of tears as they start crying, as they start weeping, and as those paper napkins are used. So, but, in the process of engaging with that problem, comes the healing. Immediately, you've opened up, you've opened up a blister, you've opened up a wound, and only when you open a wound, can you clean it, isn't it? I mean, many of you all serve in hospitals, and uh, I, Sister Victoria, so scared I pull her up again. <laughs> and when you serve in hospitals and somebody comes with a wound, the most terrible thing for them is opening up that wound and cleaning that wound. So I want you to do that. Engage with the problem, engage with whatever has affected you, and look into it deeply. The M of MT is to mend those fences. Repair those feelings. Mend those fences. What do we mean by mending those fences? Mend those fences is to be able to, if, if there has been somebody who's hurt you, somebody who has made a call to you, somebody you've not forgiven, make that call. You make that call. I'll tell you one of the times when I was doing these same classes, this is about <clears throat> two, three months back. I suddenly realized that there had been some sort of a friction between my brother and myself. And I said, hey, that's a nice thing. Here you are talking to everybody about mending fences and so on. What have you done about this relationship? Everybody knows my brother was wrong. Everybody. <laughs> At least that's what I thought. But it needn't be so. 
it needn't be so. And all I did was to take that phone and pick it up and call him and, sit and say, hi, Bobby over here. And we started talking and we started chatting. And that evening when I went back into class to talk to them about emptying your baggage, I talked with joy because suddenly I had done exactly that and with that got into the course of teaching that evening. When I did that, the daily column which I wrote went out with happiness. It wasn't a bitter column. It was something in which it came from within. All I tried to do was preach up, preach to yourself. Or physician heal thyself. Emptied my baggage. Men, I'm sorry, mending those fences. Mend those fences is, you know, what we actually mean is there's fences all over and sometimes we don't realize that parts of the barbed wire or so on has fallen down and dogs and cats and everything runs out including children but when we when we mend those fences then we are able to stop that so mend those fences which have caused you, caused you hurt that is the M and uh, how do we spell MD in Bhopal because I get a little confused do you use the A-E-M-T-Y? Oh, it's there. Okay, okay. Yeah. Sister Navya is saying, oh, same jokes you cracked in the online class. Say, you can't even change your jokes. Sadhana, you also. P. Prevent those emotions from recurring. In the process of empty, we are not saying prevent that event from recurring. You cannot prevent events. Nobody can prevent an event from recurring. But you can prevent your reaction to it. You can prevent those emotions you went through it from recurring. Yeah, suddenly it's not a reaction, it's a response. What's my response? Will be to be able to understand a little bit more of why that other person hurt us. So if, when we understand, in that process we are able to immediately forgive and say, let it be. I bring it. And if I bring in the Bible, please, and like I said, for me, it's such a lovely book. It brings the best examples. But Christ on the cross saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do, is actually a Christ who has understood why they are doing it to him and telling his Father that is God up there, that I understand why those people are up to what they are doing of killing me. Father, forgive them. I understand what they are doing. You may not, but I do. That they think that I should be here as the Messiah and saving them from the Romans. But in that process, in the process of finding that my preaching and my being a Messiah was very different from their idea of it, they have given up and they are killing me. And that's why I am being crucified on the cross. Christ over there was able to understand the worst hurt which if you look at the crucifixion, if you have ever seen that movie, which was, you all must have seen it. We all think of Christ on the cross as a tuck, tuck, nails here, there and everything and you have a crucifix? Yes. Yeah. It's, what we hang is one of the most pleasant pictures of Christ on the cross. What must have happened must have been absolutely so horrible. But he was able to even in that time forgive. And we are supposed to do the same. Not for the sake of trying to be Christ-like only, but for the sake of being able to live our normal lives because in the process of understanding why somebody has hurt us and realizing that, oh, he is hurting us from not being a bad person, but from feeling that he is doing the right thing. In that process, we can forgive him even more easily. So prevent those emotions from happening because of the simple act of understanding. Wow. And you all thought that you'd come over here for a writers and speakers close and not for a lecture on uh, all on Christianity and the Bible, right? But you know, it's so linked. It's so linked. Because what we are doing is communicating. What we are doing is exactly what the psychologist is doing in his offer. Uh, sessions with their patients. We are doing the same. We are telling people to change the world. 
And if we are going, trying to tell people to change the world, who do we have to change first? Because that's the only way. That's the only way that we become powerful enough to be able to change others. Only when we are changed. Otherwise, we can't. So, the EMP prevent those emotions from happening. The T is thankfulness. Thankfulness about what? Thankfulness about the fact that even as you are emptying yourself, you need to be thankful about something. Even as you think about the hurts that have happened to you, you need to be thankful about something. And I think, I think, if for a moment we move away from that period of feeling that we're being hurt, to looking at the present of how what is happening around us, we need to be thankful that we are not in some hospital. We need to be thankful that we are not involved in an accident. We need to be thankful that maybe our fathers and mothers are okay. We need to be thankful that we are still in a country in which we are not being thrown out or there is no persecution to that great an extent. Believe you me, if you were to fill two sides of a page on how you are being hurt and things which you are being thankful for, thankfulness will run into a book. It will go to pages and pages and chapters and chapters. Have you ever thought of it? That sometimes when you're praying, that you can pray a prayer of thankfulness and say, listen, thank you God. Thank you God, I'm sitting on a chair. Thank you God that I'm sitting in a place in which the weather is so good. That is enough and more. I saw some of you pray when I came in and I'm so happy about that. I'm so happy about that. But that is thankfulness. And when we go through these periods of hurt, maybe it's a promotion you didn't get, maybe it's somebody who got it which, where you deserved it. But when we go through those periods, be thankful for the fact that be thankful for the fact that there's so much to be thankful about. There's so much. Come on, sister, smile. You're not going to take this seriously, isn't it? When thankfulness means a sense of joy, isn't it? Right. I know that you're smiling because not smiling because you're taking taking this in your head, that's fine. But it comes from a sense of joy. And it doesn't have to be little things like this, oh, the food was okay and uh, things like that. It can just be a sense of well-being. Have you ever suddenly got up, suddenly, or in being in a process in which there's just a sense of, wow, I feel happy with the world. And that's what it is. That's what it is. So be th bring in thankfulness into your life. I will continue telling you that being a writer, that something that happens to all of us is that we move into those moods in which we are reflecting on something which has happened. When I as a writer write and I am writing about an accident or writing about some atrocity which has happened somewhere, I have to move into the emotions that have taken place to be powerful in my writing, correct? Which means that I can become depressed. The only way I can come out of that mood is to come out of that mood by weighing it with thankfulness. And I try to do that. So T of empty is thankfulness. The Y of empty is to yield to a higher power. Yield to a higher power. This course is Writers and Speakers course. is not just for people of our faith. This Writers and Speakers course is attended to, attended by Muslims, by Hindus, by people of many faiths. The prayer I made in the morning is made even with Hindus and Muslims and everybody in it. It is not just because I am addressing Sisters that I brought the prayer. Because I believe, I believe, and I tell this to people of my class who quite often are people of many other faiths, sometimes from different parts of India and outside India also. We had a girl once from Pakistan who attended a Muslim from Pakistan. I believe that this is the time when I can tell people about how God's power is and not that we have got less after that from people of those faiths. Yield to the higher power. 
when you decide to be a writer, when you decide that you're going to be a communicator, when you decide that you're going to go across to the people and change the world, ask God for His power. Not just a simple, uh, uh, not just a normal repeating prayers, but a real simple prayer saying, God, I can't do it on my own. And you'll find great things happen. Like, I would say at your snap of your finger. That's how fast things happen. I was just telling a sister during lunch, we don't even understand what prayer is about. We really don't understand what prayer is about. One day I was called, I'm sorry, I'm just deviating a moment, but I was called by Guruji. And this Guruji, because I write in the newspapers, he called me and he said that, Bob, I'd like you, I'd like both of us to talk. You, I talk about my Hinduism, you talk about your Christianity. Let's see. And when I went over there, he had a flock of people. They were all sitting on the ground. He was one of those brick swamis. And he told all of them, shoo, 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 go away. And he gave me a chair. He didn't make me sit at his feet. I wouldn't have minded. It didn't make a difference. I would have minded because I wouldn't have been able to get up. Remember grandfather, okay? <laughs> and there, as we started talking, he told me about mathematical calculations and how they come to the fact of what their mantras are and so on and so forth. And all that I heard and everything I heard. He said, okay, Bob, now it's your turn. You tell me about your God. You tell me, how do you like all of what I told you about Hinduism? I said, it's wonderful. He said, what? I said, it's wonderful. That's your path to God. You can go with your path to God, I said, in having a 999 different lives and becoming from what you are to becoming an animal and from that becoming something else and becoming something else because you believe in that because you're trying to become perfect in what you're doing, right? He said, yes. And I said, my God, my God got fed up waiting. He got fed up, Guruji, of waiting. He made this lovely creation called human beings so that they will commune with him, pray, talk to him, pray. And instead of that, we say that we are not pure enough to talk to him. He got fed up waiting and because of that, he took the punishment and sent somebody to take the punishment and after that, it is not me reaching out to God, God is reaching out to me. And you know what the Guruji said? That is too simple. <laughs> because it is too simple, my dear sisters. We who have caught that within our hands, within our reach, don't use it. Because it is so simple. It's like the WPC method, everybody expects notes and notes and notes to be given to you. And when I tell you, watch the speech that you're making with your companion. You say, come on, that's too simple. What we came all the way from different parts of India to hear something profound about how to write. And you tell me, watch the way you talk to your companion and improve that. It is those simple things which make the profound. So take that simple thing called prayer, yield to that higher power and see how it works in your communication. Really do it. Before coming here, I prayed and gave. Before making a sentence to somebody who is in trouble or, 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 or on the phone, I, I have learned to make quick prayers and say, Lord, let it be your words. Let it not be my ego. And it's a process, it's a, it's, it's a practice which I have started putting into my life because it says it's there. Your textbook, we all share the same textbook, isn't it? No, not there. <laughs> we all share the same, text, uh, the same textbook called the Bible. Yes. Or, or is yours slightly different? Mine's slightly different. <laughs> The textbook talks about prayer. I think more than anything else in the Bible, what is mentioned is prayer. And then we say, no. We will do it with our own muscle. So that is empty. E-M-P-T-Y. Close your books. Or everybody, close your books. What's E of empty? What is the E of empty? Engage with who? 
engage with those hurting thoughts. Right. M. Mending the fences, mending those broken relationships, mending those hurts and so on. T. That's how we spell it in Bombay. Okay, we go back to the original spelling P, which is prevent, prevent those what? What is preventing those emotions? Preventing our reactions to our course previously, right? T is thankfulness. What is T? Thankfulness. <laughs> We have to be thankful for thankful. And I am thankful. I am thankful, really. And I have to catch myself and make myself thankful every time I feel down. There's so much. There's so much to be thankful for. And the uh, why is Now I want you to do something, sisters. I want you to take one page from your notebooks. Uh, are you all the type of students who would hate to tear a page from your notebooks? Or do you have the spider climbing? Yes. Oh, very good, very good. Now what you do is, on a blank page, I'll give you just a few minutes. And if you are somebody who has been hurt a lot, you can take a couple of hours. And please don't let the other person next to you see what you're writing because it could be written about the other person only. <laughs> okay? I want you to now write all the hurts, all of them. Not all the hurts. I want you to write times of despair. Times when you were worried. Despair, disappointment. Okay? Times when you were worried. Times of anxiety. Times when of regret. And times of fear, disappointment, worries, anxiety, regret, fear. I want you to write down those which have been caused by other people to you. Write it down on a piece of paper and just continue writing till one of you all says, I finished. And I hope it's not Lavina because she'll write only one line. Nobody's <laughs> got her. Because she's got a memory for it, right? <laughs> <laughs> Please remember that I'm going to the best joke today. <laughs> and, and it was said, said in jest and laughter. So it was, it was good fun. We need that because it's only when we are close to each other and that we can be open with each other and that we don't hide things from each other that we are able to <coughs> encourage the other person into growing. Please understand that. Now, surrendering yourself. Okay, let's stop. Let's stop. What, what, what did you write about? We talked about disappointments, worries, anxieties, regrets, fears, right? Just now go backwards into that word. Disappointments, worries, anxieties, regrets, and fears. What's that word? What? Let's go jump backwards into an acronym which is formed by the beginning of all this. Disappointment, worries, anxieties, regret, and fear. What's the word? Dwarf. Worries are supposed to be giants, right? Now let's make them exactly what the acronym is. We're going back into, let's make them, let's dwarf them. Let's make them small. Let's stamp on them. And how we're going to do it is by taking this piece of paper and very nicely showing it to me. Now can you imagine online when it is shown to me I can zoom on it and, you know. <laughs> Shall I tell you what, Sister Sadhana wrote? And Sister Navya wrote? Of course, 
now she's got a new name, Shiny also, you know. <laughs> so she can pretend she's somebody else. But here, here's the thing. I don't want you to show that to me. Hold it to yourself. Hold it up. Now hold it like this. It's going to be magic, okay? Magic portion of how to get rid of it. Hold it again. Now tear it. <laughs> tear it. This is symbolic. This is symbolic of what you are supposed to do every day before you get into your writing or your sleep. Tell it to me. What are you doing? Exchanging it. I didn't say sharing it, I said tearing it. You don't have to increase somebody else's burden by giving yours to somebody. Tear it up. Tear it up. You know, this is something after all the course and after all the techniques that is taught in this course, people sometimes remember this. Because this is so true. I know when I have tried to write with some worry on my mind and or I've tried to speak with some worry on my mind, why, where are my thoughts? My thoughts are there where the worry is. And the only way I can speak effectively today or to anybody anytime is by getting rid of it. And only then, that's what we want to become, right? We don't want to become carriers and porters in a station carrying our burdens, but we want to become communicators. So the only way to become communicators is this is what, what we did just now was absolutely symbolic. Meaning that you will have to do it every single day if you plan to become communicators. Only when you empty your baggage will we be able to push ourselves, push our thoughts, get it across to other people. Think about it. Reflect on this. Yesterday we talked about two things. What was that? Two words. Prepare and reflect. Some of you all were not there yesterday. We talked about these two things, which means that after today's class, don't spend that time in just going back to your normal activity or whatever it is. I know there are friends here you haven't met before and you'd like to share and spend time with them. But before that, just reflect on whatever we've been through. Will you do that, please? Otherwise, you've traveled from very far. The money has been spent on this, or you're coming. Money has been is being spent on me. All that's being done, not just for fun. So please spend time on reflecting on this process which we went through just now. Reflecting on WPC. Reflecting on all the other things that we're going to learn tonight. Now. What kind of a mind do you have right now? You've taken out, you've emptied it. What minds do you have? Give me another word. Now get into words, right? We're in the word business. Give me another word. Uh -huh, I forgot, I need to hear voice also. <laughs> because we're not only into writing, we're also into being vocal. Okay? So we'll have to learn to throw our voice. We'll have to learn to be heard. It's going to be, yes, I know that silence is something that you'll practice. I agree to that. And silence is beautiful. But here in this hall can we also learn just that when we are meant to speak out, let our voices be heard. Okay, so what, what is another word for empty? <laughs> Sister, I'll get one big ear, earpiece and put it over there and make you say it out loudly. No, another word for empty. Vacuum, then? Void. Blank. Blank. So you take the word blank. No acronym in this. Thank you. 
blank. Okay, we are now blank. Now, all the time in our childhood, we have heard that empty, empty mind is a blank, is a devil's workshop. So let's not have an empty mind. So let's not keep this blank mind for always. Let's now fill it up. And what I'm going to fill, fill it, you fill it up with is a drink uh, called. I'm not sure where they get it here. It's a drink called Sprite. <laughs> have you heard of Sprite? Yes. Okay. Can you under, can you imagine why I use the word Sprite? Just think. Why? Why Sprite? I'll give a prize to the person who says why I use the word Sprite. No. Why am I using the word Sprite? Not transparent. Spirit. Sprite would be spirit. Spirit. You are coming close. Okay. But it is not spirit I am talking of. Okay. Can we say that nobody has won the prize? I have saved money just now. We are doing a course which is to do with speakers and writers. And the in-between word is a word called Sprite, which is a speaker and a writer put together. Sprite. Right. We are Spriters, meaning we are both speakers and we are writers. Okay? We are going to use that word. And because it is so unusual, because it is so, oh, so unconventional, I hope you remember it. Because if somebody says, now what should our minds be filled with? Remember that drink called Sprite. We have it here, isn't it, Gopal? Sprite? <laughs> no, why I'm saying that is normally I completely forgot. I carry that empty bottle and I use it and I push, uh, pull it up. And uh, so that you'll remember it. So that every time you remember Sprite, you'll remember what you have to fill your mind with. And you can fill your body with the drink, but fill that with the words I'm going to give you. You think that being a writer, you think that being a speaker, now that your mind is blank and it's empty and you're ready for it, you think that it is just about taking a pen and learning how to have a good handwriting? No, it's not that. You think it is just about standing over here and being able to throw your voice? No, it's not that. And I'll tell you what, the responsibility that comes to you when you learn how to speak and write. It's a huge responsibility. Because being able to convey or communicate is a responsibility which is bigger than what most people understand. And you have to understand that today. We just use the word Sprite. The S of Sprite is now that you've been filled with this lovely drink called Sprite. The S of Sprite is to speak out, to speak out and be heard. To go even further, stand up, speak out, and stand tall. Stand up, speak out, and stand tall. Oh, if you think that this is easy, very often, being a writer, being a speaker, you're standing alone against the world. I tell people this. That being a writer does not make you a popular person. It does not. <clears throat> because quite often it is standing up against conventional views. Every time I write against maybe a government in a political column, I know that that government has been elected by people who believed in that government, right? Naturally. Democracy means that the government is elected by the people who believed in that government. So when I write against the government, I am writing against all those people and not being popular. So one of the first things that we have to expect when we become writers and speak up, speakers is that we have to learn to stand, uh, we have to expect not to be liked. We have to stand up, speak out and stand tall which means that even as I stand up and speak out, I don't cow down to people and say, yes, sir. 
I see photographs today of people bowing down and touching the feet of uh, politicians in power. And I say, you want to touch the feet, touch the feet of a teacher, a guru or somebody else, but leave them alone. We don't have to count on to anybody. Learn this, that if you want to be a writer, the S of Sprite is stand up, speak out and stand tall. Don't even, don't even bend down. The P of Sprite is, there's a purpose in what you're doing. If you've been asked to give a word of thanks, if you've been asked to write an article, don't think of it as a duty. If you've been asked to be a teacher in a school, And this happens quite often. I don't know how it is here, but in, in Bombay, the government gives, aided schools, the government gives a certain portion which goes into the teacher's salary. And that teacher's salary, that's a good portion which the particular uh, congregation gets. Okay, that aided, aided money. And a teacher will tell me, Bob, you know, I am just a teacher, I am just a principal, just for the fact that that money goes into my congregation. <coughs> Does it happen Gopal pays you all as aided teachers? No. Yes. You don't have aided schools. Okay. Okay, but here I'm not making, I'm not even bothered about uh, what they tell me. I'm saying that don't think of your job as a duty. Think of it as a purpose. Think of the fact that you're communicating as a teacher, as anybody in the hospital, as whatever you're doing, not as a duty, but as a purpose. There's a purpose beyond it. And again, I'm coming back, when we align ourselves in purpose to what God has who, as a purpose for us here on earth, it becomes beautiful. It's like two tracks running together, which is the only way a train can go, right? Have you ever seen two tracks going in the opposite direction? The train will come to a standstill. It'll come to a stop. If you want really to do well as a writer or speaker, align yourself. Align yourself. God's purpose and when you find purpose in what you're doing and the purpose can be found in many ways it can be found that as you're teaching you see a dull boy you see somebody who nobody is giving any kind of attention and you decide from today I'm going to bring that boy up I'm going to bring that child up I'm going to bring that girl up suddenly your job has become a purpose I've moved away from writing and speaking I've moved away to teaching maybe find your purpose in what you're doing and things will change. The R, Sprite, the R is as a writer, as a speaker, in whatever you do, in whatever comes to you, ratify all your information. Ratify. What is the meaning of ratify? Ratify means to check. I just found out that you all have WhatsApp, which means that we are open to the outside world, which means very often we'll get, we'll get photographs of a church being burned. We'll get some other thing of a priest being thrashed. And they tell you, forward this to many people. Very often, those photographs are 10 years old. They'll take some photographs which was in Kandamal, which was in Orissa, maybe take uh, 10 years back when the atrocities happened there. And they'll send it intentionally now and tell you to forward it. Now, when you as sisters forward it to somebody, it suddenly, you all become the editors of a newspaper. Because the authentic authenticity of that photograph is how much the receiver respects the sender. You get what I mean? They immediately say, Oh, it's come from Sister Lavina. She knows things. She is our leader. We believe her. All you've done is forward it. But what they see is you sending it. It's not forwarded anymore. You have sent it. So ratify means check out. 
Check all information if you want to be a writer or a speaker before you write, before you speak. Check all information. Completely check it out in Google search whether it's fake news or whether it's genuine news. Then and only then send it out. Okay? This is now part of your burden because people will believe you. I told you my wife is in medicine as a doctor and I've told her this that as a doctor when you send out something to people they don't they don't think that her name is Lata they don't think that Lata has sent it out they think that the doctor has sent it out and they believe her all the more because they say wow such a educated person has sent it out it must be true what would she have done oh how many forwards do I have tuck, 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 send it without thinking ratify all information that comes to you. Some years back, some years back I was called uh, to this temple in uh, uh, Bombay. It's called the Hari Rama Hari Krishna temple. And there they have a big hall and in that hall they asked me to release a book. The book, the book had nothing to do with any religion. The book was a humor book written by a so-called editor of mine, editor of a newspaper. And she, uh, she, she called me over and she said, Bob, will you re release the book along with a film actor called Sh Shakti Kapoor? So, I don't think you've heard of Shakti Kapoor. Even I had I heard of the other Kapoor, but not Shakti Kapoor. Slightly <laughs> wrong, you have heard of him? Yes. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the wrong place. <laughs> okay, so Shakti Kapoor, I was there with Shakti Kapoor and he, we, have, we are both supposed to hold up the book together and say we release it and there are cameras on us and all that stuff. Great. I told the editor a very good book and all that stuff. Released a thousand copies were initially made which was given out and which was, uh, she gave it free. I got into my car and I told my driver to start driving and then I started opening the book and looking at it and suddenly I said, this is not how my editor is writes. She is okay. But this is not her language. This is extremely good language. And definitely not my news editor's language or the editor's language. So I went home and immediately and I took portions of it and I started checking it and I found that it was all written by a writer in England. She had copy pasted all the writings from that blog and had put it and compiled a book. I wrote to that writer and I asked him and he says, no, I have not given anybody any permission. I write these things every day and I put it on my blog. Obviously, she's just taken it from there and made it into a book. I immediately called her up and I said, I'm sorry, but this is wrong. This is not your book. The first thing that she did was pull back all the books. She realized she had been found out. The second thing that she did was pull out my column from my newspaper. That was the end of my column running in her newspaper, which is okay. It's all right. Two things I tried to portray, that when you ratify, you make enemies. People want to believe fairy tales. People want to believe that all the churches are burning, that next you will also be burning. People want to believe that, you know, that we are now in such a position that something terrible is going to happen to us. Yes. It could be happening, but please, before that, find out. Ratify everything. Okay? So we finished with R, and we go to Sprite, which is I, which is imbibe. Imbibe. You know, it's so, it's so nice that in the morning we talked about the word listen. Speaking is also about listening. You won't believe it, but I'm looking at each of your faces as I talk. And I call it listening with your eye. I look from the corner of my eyes, I saw Davina yawning twice. <laughs> I look at this side, no you didn't. I'm putting it there. <laughs> she didn't. But I'm looking at you for not for the uh, uh, fact of trying to be a policeman, but for the fact that when I'm speaking, I need to know how it is going well with you. And if you're not understanding to be able to speak in a better way or to be able to speak in a different language, use different words to be able to get across. 
And the only way that I can do that is if I listen with my eyes, even as I speak with my mouth. I try to tell teachers this, that even as you're teaching, don't let it be rhetorical, don't let it be just speaking out. Watch with your eyes. Sister, you as a principal know what I'm saying. I'm sure you do that all the time. But you're watching children, and the same way watch people, when you're having a conversation, imbibe, take in, take in, take in, take in. Even if I'm talking to you, take in what the person's reaction is. And then, it's when you take in reactions that you know that you're effective in what you're saying or not. I remember making two speeches, uh, making the same speech twice, once in Chennai and then I was asked to do the same thing in Bombay. In Bombay, everybody laughed, they were all happy, they loved my speech. In Chennai, they all looked down at their phones and started ordering coffee. We were in a five-star hotel. Looking at that, I realized in Chennai that I hadn't gone across, got across to the people, that there was something missing in what I was saying. And after that was my speech, the same speech I had to make in Bombay. This is how to evade, how to get away from the income tax, from the economic wing and from the police. So everybody came. Everybody came for that speech. Because I was telling them how to get away. And the speech was, be honest. <laughs> in Chennai, something was missing. And I saw it happening in the reactions. I couldn't change it in Chennai. But I was able to change it when I went back to Bombay and realized that the reaction was wrong. Because I looked and saw. I didn't go afterwards and tell my wife, you know, I had that hotel, it was terrible. You know, they have the place like this way. The, the auditorium wasn't in a good form. Sorry, you will go into auditoriums where there is no sound, uh, where there is terrible sound. You will go to places where the mics are not working. Our speakers get used to that. Get used to any eventuality, anything. Some of the first times I used to practice, I used to practice at weddings and as an MC. You know what an MC is? Master of Ceremonies, he goes over there to a wedding. My driver used to ask me, Sir, aapka paas paisa nahi hai? Why are you doing this job? And how do I tell him that I'm practicing for the fact that in a wedding, even as I crack the joke, which I think is the funniest joke in the world, there's Mr. D'Souza there shouting out to Mr. Charles over there, Charlie, how are you? And nobody hears my joke. Only thing they hear are two men shouting at each other in a wedding. What did I do? Practice. Practice. Which is why I told you in the morning, the birds will be shouting outside. You cannot stop and tell, tell God, listen God, please keep your birds quiet. Okay. He wants those birds to shout as much as he wants you to speak. The birds will shout. People will make a noise. You just have to work out ways to be able to include the interruptions into your speech. I am not saying override the interruptions. Include it into your speech. You know, this morning I told you about the Cartman show. Work out things in that way. Bring it into it. Practice it. Okay, class? I'm sorry. I mean, today's is the afternoon session is a lot of me speaking. Uh, but just take it in. When, I, when you feel that I'm getting a little boring, even if you don't feel like yawning, just do. <laughs> I'll immediately get the hint. And what will I do? I'll continue speaking. <laughs> So, imbue, take in, take in, okay? Listen to people, watch them all the time, see the actions. Oh, I forgot, there was somebody here who, I forgot the name, I wanted to remember, who said that most of the time, was it? Who is it? I'll remember a face. Who said that she, she is good with speaking to children? The second last speaker. Who said that she's good at speaking? You said that, sisters, isn't it? That you're good at speaking with children. Yeah, but when it comes to adults, it's very different. If you can hold the attention of children, you can hold the attention of adults. A child, a child's attention span is a couple of seconds. But if you can hold the attention of a child, 
you've got enough practice to be able to hold the attention of bigger children like you all. Sorry about that. I couldn't help it. But what I meant is bigger children like us. We are all big children finally. So practice on children. If you want to be good speakers, practice on children. Okay, so that is the I which is in view. And the next is T, which is thinker. A good speaker, a good writer is a thinker. Has to be a thinker. You have to be people who don't accept anything without uh, unconditionally. Who just say, yes, I believe completely what is being said. Open it up. Open it up. Completely look at what it is. If you are going to be writers, you need to know, you need to tell the people that you write for, you speak to, how you came to this conclusion. Like just now. I'll just give you an instance. When I gave you this words on the cross, the Father forgive them for they know not what they do. If I had stopped there, if I had stopped right there, as sisters, as people who have studied the Bible thoroughly, you would have said, correct. But when I opened it up and said why he said it, I was, in other words, showing you that I had opened it up myself and thought about it, right? You don't have to give this to anybody. Christ said it on the cross, we believe totally. And most of us, if you look into it, have accepted those words of Christ on the cross as just words on the cross without thinking why he said it to his father up there. Have you ever thought of it, sister? Have you ever thought of it? Why did God tell God up there to forgive them, assuming that the God up there didn't know that he had to forgive them? Why? Why? Did you ever think of why? You mean a God up there didn't, doesn't, all-knowing God won't know that he has to forgive them? An all-knowing God doesn't know that, he, that they don't know what they do? Why? Think about it. Give me an answer. It could be right, it could be wrong. I could be right, I could be wrong. Why? Because? Because of blasphemy according to them, their beliefs. And Jesus said that he Okay, what are that, exactly. What I'm saying is, why would he tell his father to forgive them because they know not what they do, as making, assuming that his father didn't know? He said that in some he said for us, that moment he was saying, Correct. Correct. Thank you for that. Because at that moment, and that was one of the reasons that he came and lived on this earth with us so that he will get to know us and some of all the things that we do, so that it became an explanation to a God above of what we go through. That was Christ's reason for living on this earth, which for me is one of the most beautiful reasons. That a God up there was so concerned about what is happening down on earth that he not just he didn't just send his son to die, okay? He sent his son to live among people, to understand what they're going through, and to understand the feelings, and in a way that was an explanation and saying, God, I have now found out certain things which you sent me for. So forgive them because they don't know why they are killing me. Suddenly the reason for him living on earth became apparent, became full. Have you ever thought of it? This is my reason. I could be wrong. This is not theologian's reason. This is just that I mulled over it, asked myself, why would he tell an omnipotent God something other than the fact that he lived on earth and understood and understands each one of us? That was a small aside. But like I said, think it out. Thinking is a beautiful process, sisters. You're opening up. Your faith gets stronger. Your faith gets stronger and you're able to see things which other people are not saying. And you say, oh, now I understand that portion from the Bible. Now I understand the prodigal son. Now I understand something else. 
So do it. Become thinkers. That is T. And the E of Sprite is. Oh, what's the E of Sprite? What do you think it is? Enthusiasm. Enthusiasm. All the things that we shouldn't be talking of after lunch, I'm bringing in here. But thank God for that. Good. Because the only way to wait somebody else, but, and I'm not talking of you all. You are not about the, one of the best audiences. Most of the other audiences, if they give me the chance to speak after lunch, they would be like snoring. <laughs> Enthusiasm. When you write, when you speak, when you're talking, when you're having a conversation, bring in enthusiasm, bring in, bring in passion. If you don't bring in passion, then don't talk. If you don't bring in enthusiasm, then don't write. Because whatever you do, in whatever way we are explaining, whether it's to children, whether to grown-ups, whether we're speakers, whether we're writers, bring the passion in. There was a club called the Round Table many, many years back. And this club was called, it's a British club, it's an English club and it's brought to India and you retire at 40. 40, they consider you an old man. So I retired at 40 and I have been the chairman for two years. I retired at 40 and many years back, many years later I went to see the club. I said, how are you guys doing? At that time I was an old man, I was 42. <laughs> and they were all 39, 38, 37, 40 and so on. I said, how are you guys doing? We are fine. Uh, you remember me? I was the chairman. Yes, we remember you. You were the chairman. The thing about you is you used to be passionate and enthusiastic about everything that you said. But Bob, 20% of the time you were wrong. But you would say it in such a way that you made 100%, all of us may feel that 100% you were right. That made me think, okay, I remember that that happened many years back. I went back and thought, well, was I right or wrong? And I realized that when we believe something, go for it full. Maybe later on we'll find we're wrong. But at that moment, please don't be skeptical and say, I am not sure, but let us think that we are right and we'll go into it. Nobody come with you. 20% of the time, I was wrong. Maybe I'm bluffing. I'm not sure that there's a, they said 40% of the time, but we keep it at 20%, okay? <laughs> Go with it passionate. Go with it enthusiastic. Go with it with, with a smile on your face to convince. That is communication. That is communication. When you came over here, and we, shall we do the whole exercise again about you all coming up there and giving me your names and so on? Come up here running, stand over here and say, this is my name, this is what I plan to do with the post and this is what I have, uh, I'm going to try and do to change the world. Shall we do it again? Okay, we take five people and choose them. Victoria is wondering whether again I choose them. <laughs> but that is the enthusiasm you need to have. Whatever the feeling that you're going through, my elder daughter finally became the anchor, the TV anchor for Bloomberg TV. And she would land up at the TV station. Her name is Varuna. I call her Rona. She would land up at the TV station and from there she would call me and say, Dad, I cannot go in. Dad, I'm feeling so down. You know, the shouting match which my sister and I had, it's still in my mind. And I would tell her, I said, Rona, as soon as you stand in front of the camera, all that the world has to see is your enthusiasm and your passion. And this is important when you go up as speakers. Let people see your zeal. Let people feel your passion. And when that happens, you can make changes. We think, especially in India, that words will jump out of the page and dance around in the minds of people. That's how we talk. We really feel that we can talk about happiness in a tone which has 
happiness is found all over the world. <laughs> Sometimes in the North Pole, sadness also is found. Okay, sadness is found. Happiness is also found in India. It, yesterday I felt very happy. <laughs> Even as I sound so comical talking this way, sadly, a lot of us think that words will jump up and in their sense, they will ignite the minds of people. It doesn't happen that way. You have to make yourself enthusiastic before you can bring in enthusiasm in others. Have you heard people who preach good homilies? They are literally bouncing on the pulpit. They are filled with joy. And more than the words which they convey and get across to you is the absolute enthusiasm and joy which springs out of them. That is needed. And on the winds of that enthusiasm, on that will sit the words which you'll get across. So use it. Yes, what you do in silence, in prayer is so important. But when you communicate, show passion. So that is pride. Okay? Fill yourself next time and every time you go somewhere. Is pride allowed over here? Sister Philu? It's allowed. No, I don't want to bring in anything and after you be told, why did you mention Sprite? We drink only Coca-Cola. 